Uh, good morning, team. Uh, first of all, let me appreciate uh, all of you who have been able to wake up and join us this lovely Saturday morning for our talk for the day. My name is Dr. Mutu Ambuvi, part of the Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation team. And our, well, our mandate as EMKF basically is to try and provide timely, accessible, and quality, life-saving emergency care throughout Kenya. Uh, in Kenya in particular. And we do this through a whole lot of programs, including uh, training uh, participants in uh, emergency care course, uh, point of care ultrasound. We provide resources, materials, um, books, and all these things that center around emergency care, both for the rural and for the urban setup. And uh, that is why we, that is the space in which we engage in, in regards to emergency care in the country. And part of what we do in terms of educating the masses and bringing people into this fold of understanding what emergency medicine is and what exactly our concepts are as Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation is that we host uh, once a month, we host a talk uh, that is usually, um, a, a talk, we get a topic of discussion and that's, that topic is what we use to, we have a discussion around it in regards to emergency care every, when we are actually here. Okay, sorry, uh, yeah. So we, we do a talk every once every month uh, basically, it's really more of a, a presentation with a discussion at the end where people can actually ask questions, uh, talk about what they what they think needs to be improved in regards to emergency care. So it's really a very open program, very um, liberal guys can talk and discuss. And uh, given that we do that, we usually have a presenter every, every single uh, time we meet up. And once the presenter gives uh, the presentation, then we have a discussion to see what we what we have learned, what we want to maybe change in regards to our practices and things like that. Uh, so for this particular Saturday, we are going to be discussing the assessment of the sick child in the emergency department. Uh, pediatrics and emergency care is one thing that has really been, uh, one of the things that people have really requested for. And it's a pleasure for us to actually be able to have this discussion done today. And I'd like to introduce the person who's going to take us through this discussion. And his name is uh, Mr. Jason Kiruja. Jason Kiruja is a BSN uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing graduate from the University of Nairobi. He has worked for, he has, he has around 14 years experience working in the pediatrics department with 10 of those years being as an ETAT instructor. ETAT basically stands for emergency treatment and triage, emergency triage and treatment for uh, pediatrics. And he's an instructor in that course, which is one of the courses that most uh, doctors and nurses usually go for in regards to helping to understand how to deal with kids when they present to the, sorry, how to deal with children when they present to the emergency department. He, he's also a Master of Science in Health Systems graduate and is currently pursuing his Masters of Science in Pediatric Nursing. So this is someone who has a lot of wealth in regards to pediatric, uh, pediatric nursing and in regards to pediatric management and pediatric emergency since he's an instructor at ETA. And it's truly a pleasure to have him with us. Um, I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, looking forward to the questions that are going to follow. And I hope that we're going to have a lot of fun and learn a lot of things and really uh, get that knowledge that we require over the next uh, three hours of this uh, discussion. Okay, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Tambur. Okay, good. So I'm going to combine aspects of uh, PALS, that like pediatric advanced life support, and uh, aspect of um, ETAT Plus. So I'm the clinical manager at ETAT Plus at uh, the Kenya Pediatric Association. So the, the, the guidelines are all based on uh, mostly the same evidence. Uh, the globally available evidence. So there's uh, some synergy in the guidelines. A few uh, differences in style, but uh, the core content should be the same. So we use the structured approach uh, to assess uh, a severely ill child wherever they get in contact with you. So we use the a, B, C, D, E approach. This is for a child who has not collapsed. For the child is unwell, but uh, they have not collapsed. So you still use the uh, A, B, C, D, E approach to assess them. Uh, so we'll uh, make sure that the air is safe. We assess the breathing. We check the circulation. 
disability and exposure. We do this without clacking the patient, without taking the details of what they have brought them. Because if a child needs oxygen, they need oxygen. It, it doesn't matter when they started coughing. So we quickly do the ABCD. And uh, some of these aspects of the ABCD are also used in the triage. So we can highlight a few uh, unique aspects about children. Children are not small adults. So our dosages will be different. Uh, our approach is also different uh, depending on this. So the airway of the child, we've had several that it is funnel shaped. The, the, the narrowest part being at the cricket ring. So for an object uh, obstruction, it becomes a problem uh, when we are dealing uh, with children and managing the area. So these are also informed use of non cuffed uh, tubes in children, but now we are, especially in emergency care, there's also uh, using of uh, cuffed tubes in children, but with, with um, lesser cuff pressure. Uh, so airway differences, uh, we did physics and you remember the gas loss. This is one of the gas laws uh, called Pusilu. Uh, so this is the gas law which says that air, the resistance of air through a tube is inversely proportional uh, to, is, um, to its radius. So if resistance if the tube is narrow, the resistance increases significantly, as you can see. So a child, uh, say an infant, that uh, uh, you have the, the normal airway, for example, this one is indicated as four millimeters. So if there is edema and you narrow that tube, then the resistance you increase, the resistance increases uh, 16 times. So for an adult with the same level of inflammation, you only increase the resistance three times. So you can do this practically by usually you can, uh, I, we demonstrate this in training that you can block one nostril and try to breathe. And the breathing is not that difficult. Then you can block the two nostrils partially by reducing the the diameter, then you'll feel that breathing gets more difficult. So the same happens if a child gets uh, inflammation in their airways, their breathing gets um, severely uh, compromised because of the increased resistance. So other anatomical differences is that uh, children have a bigger head uh, in, in proportion to the body. So the they may tend to flex their head more, so there is no, there is more need to keep uh, checking uh, and repositioning them so that they don't obstruct their airway. The space left in the in the mouth by the tongue is much smaller because the tongue occupies a more space. The buccal cavity is much smaller, so any inflammation or uh, the, the tongue becomes a, a big uh, cause of airway obstruction. So they have a P. epiglottis, they have a, a larynx that is anterior and higher. So they have a narrow point you've mentioned is, is at the, the cricoid. So the heart occupies more space in the chest and they have vulnerable uh, abdominal organs, the abdominal developed. All these are unique um, aspects of uh, the pediatric patient. Another one which is uh, not listed here, which is of importance to us, is that uh, they, they are more diaphragm breathers because the ribs are still more horizontal, so they don't use more of the ribs. So that's why we assess the e, the lower chest wall in drawing to check on the work of the diaphragm. So the the being their pragmatic breathers, abdominal extension, they also worsens their breathing. So you'll also be checking out that their abdomen is not descended, especially for infant. They'll use more of the diaphragm to breathe, and if a distended abdomen uh, minimizes the, uh, their breathing effort. So uh, babies are 
especially below six months, they are obligateness of breathers. So a running nose with a blocked nose becomes a cause of distress. So uh, note that and they need to keep clearing the airways to reduce uh, on, on their distress. The trachea and the bronchi are smaller. They have a minimum obstruction. And so a minimum obstruction makes a big difference that we have seen the physics behind that. Uh, we've measured about um, ventilation me being diaphragmatic. So always put a nasogastric tube to decompress the stomach in case of any distension. So the initial steps, we use the same. We observe the child, are they alert? So if they are not alert, then you use the basic life support steps. So the child is alert, then you can use the, 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 the four S's and A, B, C, D approach. So uh, safety, we are in the era of COVID and um, you need to observe safety, have your PPEs in place, especially working in triage and emergency set setups. Uh, then you stimulate verbal and tactile and you activate your teams, your emergency teams in case the child is not responsive. So you need to be in a setting where you can provide the emergency care. Then we start our ABCDE. So uh, we've mentioned about uh, activating your emergency team. And the setting is a place uh, that you are able to offer your resuscitation. Remember, preparedness is key in um, in resuscitation, especially for the children, children will um, remain decompensated for a very short time. So the time is always of your essence. You can see a baby who struggling to breathe. Uh, you look uh, away, you look back, they have stopped breathing. So time is of essence. So preparedness is key in our setting, uh, as we said, to, to offer emergency care in children. So remember to always uh, communicate uh, with the parent, as you'll see some of the unique aspect of this uh, uh, group of our clients is that uh, the the smaller ones, even the bigger ones, they depend on somebody else to explain to you what's happening. So uh, starting our A, B, C, D, so we start with the airway. We want to check if the airway is patent. So assess. Uh, if the child is alert, you can assess them while still the parent. If not alert, then you will need to move the child to the resuscitation uh, couch. So uh, then remember if there is strider, listen for strider or other airway noises. And if it's group, we nebulize with adrenaline. So we'll use uh, adrenaline and epinephrine interchangeably because uh, of uh, we, are, we use both uh, British and American English here. So we check the look into the mouth. So if the airway, if, if the air is clear, if there are any secretions, you need to sanction. So remember, the children have more delicate airways. So even when you're sanctioning, you need to limit your sanction uh, vacuum, uh, the vacuum pressure. So if uh, you can be able to set, we set uh, between 80 to 120 millimeters of uh, mercury pressure. The smaller the baby, the lower the, the vacuum will need. So it's uh, not advisable to put on the maximum suction. And that can injure the mucous membranes of the children. So always limit the pressure. It also is good to limit the time. Like for newborns, we limit to sanction to 10 seconds, then take a small break, then uh, get back to sanctioning again. In any other secretions, vomitors, you will um, you will um, a sanction foreign bodies. You remove only what you see. Also, as good practice, we never do a blind finger sweep. So, if the air is at risk, the tongue is falling back. Then, especially for babies who are unresponsive or unconscious, 
then you may need to support airway. So apart from positioning, you need to support with an oropharyngeal airway. And uh, we, we have them in most of our setup, simple tubes to use. Uh, Contraindication just in the child is a lot, mostly. The one who have a gag reflex and they can spit out the airway. So for the unconscious patient, it's safe to put size uh, from midi sizes. Some guidelines, you say the flange at the side of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. So midi sizes is what you're using it at to the angle of the jaw. So to insert, you may need a tongue depressant, depress the tongue and slide it in. Or you can put the convex side uh, next to the tongue. And once you're in, the, the rationale is for that you need to hold the tongue down. So once you're in, then you can rotate it in place. So if, whichever design you use, the rationale is that you need to get the tongue out of your way, then you just slide the the oropharyngeal to hold on to the tongue to stop the tongue from obstructing the airway, especially for the unconscious part. So airway positioning. So there's uh, been some changes in airway positioning. So we are positioning all children, including neonates, into a sniffing position. So the best way to describe sniffing is uh, slightly extended. So that will be the best way to say uh, sniffing. So using the sniffing position for all children, and we are still using the head tilt, uh, chin lift maneuver. Uh, remember in trauma, when you suspect C spine injury, you use the jaw thrust. So head tilt, chin lift, as you see here, into a slightly extended position so that you can have uh, the sniffing position. So the, the, the a new uh, way you can have this demonstration is that the grabella or the, the nose is at the same uh, or is, and the chin are horizontally aligned. That will be a slightly extended position, not hyperextended and, you, and not neutral anymore. So you're saying it uh, slightly extended into a sniffing position. Uh, so I think that that what came out in 2020 in a number of uh, guidelines that we can now use the uh, sniffing position for all ages, slightly extended. So after airway, remember we've done a number of procedures in airway, positioning, supporting with an oropharyngeal um, sanction if need be, then we can nebulize if there's group and we nebulize with undiluted adrenaline if there is a due to the viral group. So you nebulize with with uh, undiluted one in a thousand adrenaline and two mils, two vials, then you nebulize. So those are AI uh, procedures, clearing, positioning, support with an oropharyngeal nebulizer in case there is upper airway inflammation as seen in group, then you nebulize. Uh, with the airway safe, now you can move to breathing. We rapidly assess breathing. We want to find out if oxygen is getting in through the lungs and if they are able to bring out carbon dioxide. So check on the uh, ventilation. So uh, we are we'll be looking out for yeah, our what is tissue uh, hypoxia and tissue hypoxia will be brought about by hypoxemia. So we want to find out if you are able to get oxygen into the blood. So we'll uh, assess a number of uh, points and uh, we don't want to get to complications of uh, organ failure. If you get organ ischemia, can lead to an oxid brain injury and even affect the heart. So we use a number of signs to assess rapidly breathing. Uh, 
in teaching you make it easier by starting from head to the chest where you get the rate then check for head nodding as you go down to the nose you look for nasal uh, flaring get to the mouth you look for central cyanosis uh, the listen for granting get to the chest you check if there is in drawing look at the depth of the breathing is it deep is it shallow check the symmetry then auscultate okay so we able to uh, go through those steps then you also remember pass oxygen so we look for a number of more signs than you look for an adult to check on the work of breathing so you look for uh, is it the rate and um, immediately if there is any hypoxemia as indicated by uh, oximetry of less than 90 you start oxygen immediately so other indications for other absolute indications for oxygen in case your machine your pulse oximeter is not working well you can use um, if the central cyanosis uh, for some guides they'll say like the pulse it says that sign off your respiratory failure if there is grunting if there is a head nodding because it shows use of accessory muscles to breathe the muscles in the neck the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid the overworking makes the head bob so the baby is not agreeing with you they're in distress so you need to start them on oxygen immediately look for lower chest wall in drawing so you you can get uh, in the also called uh, recession retractions so you can get the lower chest wall in drawing as the diaphragm is overworking then you can also get uh, intercostal and um, coastal can have even the sternal the sternal recession in the very tiny babies you can also get uh, the sternal retractions so the one which is easy for many of us to observe is the lower chest wall in drawing also it's if it's severe then you need to start on oxygen immediately tachypnea it's above 70 is fast for any age group so you start on oxygen immediately if you have inability to drink or any sign of altered consciousness plus any sign of respiratory distress it could be you said you've seen the uh, uh, anoxic uh, brain uh, setting in due to tissue hypoxia then you need to start on oxygen also immediately so if you have any altered consciousness with any sign of respiratory distress uh, and you are not able to get uh, an oximeter reading then you need to start on oxygen so uh, we can be able to see a few of these signs and be able to check if we can identify them. I'll be able to see the lower chest wall in drawing. This baby. Okay, they are able to drink with difficulty, just more sip and continue catching their breath. And you can see the diaphragm is overworking gives you the lower chest wall in drawing so the so this child is on oxygen via nasal catheter we'll go through that later so you can be able to see the child is breathing and see if it's somebody who has been running and this is a deep uh, or acidotic breathing and uh, this child is uh, on transfusion and you can be able to see that non-respiratory complications or problems can present with respiratory signs so please remember that and you'll be checking out for them uh, so that uh, like severe anemia dka there are some of the problems that will give you deep, deep uh, breathing okay so we've seen these uh, signs the childhood signs so we, it's good also to ask ourselves where is the problem so that we can also plan our management uh, carefully so the child is not getting in enough oxygen it could be 
due to problems of the air weight, problems of the lung tissue, problems of circulation. So it's always good to find out where the problem is. So then uh, we have uh, the first uh, possible point of problem is ventilation perfusion mismatch. And so the, the lung receives oxygen, but there is no blood flow that can occur like in pulmonary embolism. And then the, the lung receives blood, but there is no oxygen or air getting into the alveolar surface. So that can occur in asthma when you have the airways uh, constricted. It can occur in cases where you have mucus plugs uh, seen in various types of pneumonia. And then in bronchiolitis also you can have mucus plugs blocking the airways. So we can also have a problem of diffusion deficit. The alveoli surface reduces the uh, gas moves by diffusion across the semipermeable membrane. So that membrane when it's affected either due to inflammation in pneumonia or uh, uh, distress syndrome. So we can have problem of uh, oxygen diffusing in and carbon dioxide diffusing out. Another problem could be lung collapse. So which can occur that at electasis, it can occur in pneumonia or bronchiolitis where mucus plug block the small vessels and due to change of pressure can cause the lungs to collapse. Uh, what we forget is the, the disordered uh, control of breathing as seen in uh, when you have a respiratory dis depression. Uh, the central respiratory depression can be due to increased intracranial pressure, uh, drug overdose, uh, maybe intra-op, post-op, you can get children who have been sedated or after conversions uh, or during treatment for conversion, we can have uh, uh, as causing some of the respiratory de depressions. The lungs are okay, the circulation is okay, but the breathing is uh, the breathing rate usually is the one which uh, drops and can even stop uh, due to the CNS. Uh, depression. So always be on the lookout for that, especially for the child, for the children who have had uh, conversion, anti-conversant given uh, other drugs or they have had uh, drug overdose. So the other uh, cause of uh, lack of delivery of adequate oxygen in blood for children is shunting of blood. And that this occurs in cyanotic uh, uh, diseases. For example, is the technology of a law. Uh, so we have the transposition of uh, great uh, vessels. So it's the abnormal anatomy. So that that makes the the deoxygenated blood keep circulating uh, without uh, going to the lungs. And this one occurs usually if uh, the pathway to the lungs has some form of obstruction. So pulmonary artery either malpositioned or it has um, atresia or stenosis. So the blood not going to the lungs to oxygenate. And also maybe when it's coming out of the lungs, there is also uh, mixing. If you have a huge uh, uh, if there's a huge hole between the ventricles or the atria, then the blood is mixing. So that, that, that occurs, especially in the small babies, before any correction is done. So remember that, especially for the uh, young, young, it can, can be detected at any age, but usually the severe forms uh, are usually detected early, early within the first week of life. So, um, so in our emergency setup, you want to identify inadequate breathing so that you can intervene immediately. So look for those signs, the head nodding, cyanosis, grunting. So uh, listen for a baby is grunting, then you start 
uh, you start you start them on oxygen immediately. So we said you sculpted or you listen for a wheeze. If there is a wheeze, also this is the time you give uh, bronchodilators also plus oxygen therapy. So we said um, SpO2 less than 94 plus any sign of distress or any other ETAT emergency signs. So these are also, we call them the danger signs. The child is not able to feed, uh, is convulsing. All these are danger signs that you start those children on oxygen. So, uh, so we can, in children, uh, giving standard uh, oxygen or just the oxygen you can give in a unit is we have only two delivery um, uh, methods that using nasal prongs and using the non breather. So that makes work easier. You're either on low flow and prongs or on high flow with non breather. So preferred method of delivering oxygen to feed infant is a use of nasal prongs. So it's, uh, they tolerate it more because an alert child will keep removing the masks. So standard flow rate for neonate you use a 0 0.5 to 1 liter per minute. So that's the standard um, flow. So infant 1 to 2 liters per minute. So preschoolers 1 to 4 liters per minute. Uh, school um, going children 1 to 6 liters. So this delivers an FiO2 of about 35%. So that's the standard flow rate. High flow rate for preterm neonates is one liter. For term newborns is a two liters. For infant, four liters. For older children is a maximum of eight liters. So this delivers a higher FiO2 of 50%. If children are not uh, getting to the targeted SpO2, at that five, then you can switch to high flow. So high flow uh, requires closer monitoring because you're getting to uh, like step up uh, equivalent of monitoring. Then you need to monitor closer and you'll see the need for humidifying oxygen in this case. So, uh, so in, in ICU setup, they might give a higher floor, floor rate in case they are using high flow nasal cannula systems. So we face masks, the simple face mask and head boxes are no longer recommended because of the danger of CO2 accumulation. So check uh, nasal prongs, even if you're on standard flow, you'll still keep checking. So you can monitor three hourly, uh, especially for obstruction by mucus. Make sure all the connections are secure, children are moving and they can remove the prongs. Uh, if possible, you can strap them on the cheeks. So, and also at the back of the neck. So, so then check that the flu is correct uh, every time. And you'll see mention about monitoring, you're checking the SPO2. So, if you give very high flow rate, there is risk of gastric distension. If you have gastric inflation, so check that there is no gastric distension. So you can also remove and clean the prongs at least twice a day. You can just wipe with um, with, with 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 the wet gold. So so you can also remove and and clean the prongs so that they're not obstructed by mucus plugs. We said them, simple masks are no longer recommended for use in children. And if you check uh, the WHO oxygen delivery for oxygen guidelines for children, the simple masks were removed because of a higher risk of carbon dioxide toxicity. And we have the non breather, which gives a higher FiO2 and it's much safer to use. So we said non breather mask is, will use high flow rate, 10 to 15 liters per minute, delivering an FO2 of uh, more than 
So this is ideal for patients who have just been resuscitated post resuscitation or patients who are quite unwell, severely uh, unwell, and they're not uh, they're not alert because if they're alert, they'll keep removing the masks. So remember, we are titrating the oxygen so that uh, if the child did not respond to, they didn't get the targeted SpO2 reading with high flow needs of prongs, then you need to change to non rebreather. So we are titrating uh, by checking every 15 minutes, depending on the patient uh, clinical condition. So very unwell child, you can start with high flow, then keep reducing as a child um, improves. So remember the rate should be above 10 liters and the bag should remain inflated so as not to reduce the oxygen concentration. So the oxygen reserve for a bag needs to be full so as a child is breathing, they are able to open the inspiration valve. Don't remove the valves. I've seen some places where people remove these uh, valves on the non breather mask. So the flaps here, the ones for expiration, they open during expiration because they are pushed by air open. And then when you breathe in, they occlude. So the child breathes in. Uh, the air from the oxygen from the reservoir bag because these inspirational verbs opens when there's negative pressure so it's 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 able to open during the when the child is breathing okay so we, we have an oxygen tubing which goes to your oxygen source either on the wall socket or into the flow meter attached to the cylinder. So you need to humidify uh, oxygen wherever you're using high flow, either with the nasal prongs, high flow, or um, non rebreather. So if you're using uh, flow rates above four liters with nasal catheters or nasal prongs, you must humidify. So we are, you humidify by using distilled water, which is changed daily. So distilled water is changed daily. If it remains and you keep topping up, it can become a good place for bacterial contamination. So bacteria can grow in the water which you're keeping topping up. So ideally change the water daily. And then the tube, if you're using, can be cleaned. Uh, just by uh, the kitchen soap detergent cream. Uh, rinse thoroughly, let it dry if it's not being used, and then ready for the next patient. So if you're using standard flow nasal catheter or nasal prongs, it does, uh, you may not need to humidify it. So we mentioned about uh, the prescription, uh, the oxygen, the standard flow rate, and the and the non rebreather mask. Oxygen catheter, we insert in one nostril in case you don't have access to uh, nasal prongs. Uh, so the nasal catheter looks like a feeding tube, size um, eight, but the blue feeding tube. And some places you can even improvise with that. Or well, they, they work the same as, na as nasal prongs. You insert the distance from the tip of the nose to the inner margin of the eyebrow, that's the, how deep you go. Then you're able to, to connect the tube to the oxygen source and give the same flow rate as you use the nasal prongs so it can secure the tube. In cases, the other one you can use is nasopharyngeal catheter. It goes much deeper. The distance it goes is from the tip of the nose to the triggers of the ear. And it goes much deeper, requires closer monitoring, but gives a slightly slightly higher FiO2, so, but uh, requires more closer monitoring. So, But I'm sure now most of our hospitals have nasoprongs and you can be able to use nasoprongs more comfortably. Remember to humidify when you're using high flow. 
So we enabled, we auscultated this child, apart from oxygen, the other intervention that you may need is to, uh, to attend to the child who is wheezing. So infants, or mostly children less than two years, their bronchioles have less of the smooth muscle. So the cause of the wheeze is not usually the constriction, but uh, due to the mucus narrowing the airways. So that's why you have the wheezing for this age group. So if you see this uh, chart seen uh, put here, so infants have more bronchiolitis. The mucus are the one causing the narrowing and the, the wheezing. So you can have another group, uh, the preschoolers, then their wheezing could mostly be due to a viral uh, infection and uh, we start treating them asthma in older children, the ones who are school going. So in bronchiolitis, uh, we need to let the child be able to bring up that mucus more easily. So you need to break it down and be able to bring up the mucus. And we use uh, a hypertonic saline to nebulize the smaller babies with infant. Sometimes you can do a bronchodilator trial, especially if there was no improvement with use of hypertonic saline. Uh, I think there are also some papers which have put that uh, you may use, so just use normal saline in case you don't have uh, hypertonic saline to nebulize. You can just use uh, normal saline and it, it will also get you some improvement. But uh, we said the reason why we are using the saline is because the cause of the narrowing and hence the wheezing, it's usually due to the mucus in the, in the bronchioles causing the narrowing and the wheeze. So older children we treat uh, as asthma, acute asthma. So in an emergency setup, you may not be so sure uh, if it's asthma or not, but um, you may, or they'll, it's safer to nebulize and be able to follow up the child, especially if we don't have any contraindication for NEPS. So most uh, children with asthma will have a wheeze in addition to cough or difficulty in breathing. So you'll be worried of severe forms of asthma, which are also called life-threatening asthma. So if the child presents with any a danger sign that you and they have a wheeze, then you treat us severe form of asthma because we said asthma can be life threatening. So we'll be able to classify the asthma using these uh, signs the same way pneumonia is classified in uh, WHO guidelines. So it makes work quite easy and makes um, practice uh, uniform across uh, many setups. So children who are cyanosed or oxygen saturation less than 90, they are unable to drink. So they have reduced level of consciousness or they are granting plus a wheeze. So that is treated as severe asthma. So if they have a wheeze and they only have tachypnea and lower chest wall in drawing, then it's treated as mild or moderate asthma. So our worry is the severe asthma, the mild ones, you can um, have time to consult, but uh, severe asthma, you need to act immediately. Uh, start on oxygen, you can start a bronchodilator, so you use uh, subutamol. You can add uh, atrovet, but you put tropium bromide, and you start uh, steroids as soon as possible. So if this child was not able to fit, then you need to give IV steroids. So uh, if they're not able to take oral steroids. So then mild and moderate asthma, they can just uh, continue with their bronchodilator. So we'll be able to keep reassessing this, these children, especially asthma, which is responding to treatment, which has very uh, quick recovery. They are able to recover very fast and sometimes we may not even need to admit. So to nebulize, uh, for children less than five years, uh, to
worry is for the under fives. Uh, so not the under five, those are just 2.5 mgs of subutamol solution. So check if the nebulizer uses oxygen. There are those which are oxygen driven and there are those which are air driven, just air. So if, if it's oxygen driven, you're getting the benefit of giving a higher um, uh, oxygen concentration. And you can nebulize, we nebulize every 20 minutes, reassess, nebulize, reassess. For the first one hour, you can nebulize up to three doses if the child did not respond to the initial doses. So reassess after each dose. So nebulization can be up to three times in an hour because we are reassessing every 20 minutes. And in some places, we are able to we are able to do even continuous nebulization, especially in the life-threatening asthma. So another way you can provide subutamol, it's use of inhaler uh, with a space and mask. So the mask should be used in all ages below three years. Even older children who are not, uh, they are better and well, they're not um, complying to use of our spacer on its own, they need to, to use, to use a, a mask for all age groups. So even the ones which are older, maybe they are better and well, and they're not cooperating, you can use a mask. So severe asthma, we give six puffs. Six puffs is equivalent to one nebulization. So you can treat the six puffs as one nebulization every 20 minutes. So the child takes you puff once and you let the child breathe in. So some will say six breaths or 10 breaths. So you can, you can give one puff. You can use 10 breaths is commonly commonly used so one puff 10 breaths one puff another 10 breaths you can have breaks in between the puffs after the breathing and then give up to six puffs then let the child uh, rest then reassess after 20 minutes give the bronchodilator time to work after 20 minutes still in distress then repeat and the cycle so Six puffs, you said, is equivalent to one nebulization with 2.5. It's treated as one nebulization. The one you had seen, I used 2.5 mg of subutamol. So for mild or moderate asthma, use two puffs every 20 minutes for one hour, if need be. So you can keep checking and refer accordingly. So some cases where you're not able to get a space up, people are able to improvise and by using bottles and, but now the spacers are getting more affordable for many people. But if not able to afford, then you can improvise with a water bottle. So uh, this, we given oxygen, we've given bronchodilator. So other possible supportive care can use for an, this child who is in distress, you can prop them up. Uh, sometimes we may need to use uh, physiotherapy, maybe be just physio. Yeah, so you, uh, sometimes if they're older children, you, they'll uh, adopt the most comfortable position for themselves. So you can plan your procedures that um, you reduce minimal handling, collect your samples at the same time so that you minimize the handling. The more you handle, the more distress you're causing, the more demand for oxygen uh, you'll be causing, the more you'll worsen their, their distress. So you may need to think of assisted feeding, maybe uh, uh, maintenance fluids, or if you, you can be able to observe this work going on, on need to put an NG tube, even for children with some form of respiratory distress. So higher flow nasal catheter, we said it's also possible and we'll monitor it as you monitor CPAP. So continue monitoring, we said the clinical signs will tell us if there is improvement, especially if the work of breathing is uh, 
reducing so we'll we'll um, be able to continue monitoring the clinical signs our target during uh, therapy uh, during supplemental oxygen you want to achieve a saturation of 90 to 96 percent some guide most of the guidelines are putting a upper limit of 96 i've seen a few guidelines putting a upper limit of 98 but 96 is a commonly used so that can be our target during oxygen therapy that you don't want to give uh, higher saturations oxygen is a drug and it causes um it, co it, it it causes damage to the brain to the lungs and to the newborn even to the eyes so you, this happens by accumulation uh, of uh, oxygen radicals because the children have a bigger ability to to have many antioxidants so the role of antioxidant is to mop up these radicals so in children that ability is lower so giving 100 percent oxygen increases this reactive oxygen species and makes oxygen toxic in high dose so our monitoring target is 90 to 96 percent remember you'll, the child will be epoxemic if the SpO2 is 90 and you need to continue to continue giving oxygen. So other monitoring that you can do in a place where you can do your blood gas analysis, uh, continue checking the partial pressure of oxygen and as match it with the FiO2 that you're giving, check that the carbon dioxide is not accumulating and that can be seen by also looking at the, the pH level. So continue monitoring if this is possible. Uh, so SPO2 uh, can have errors. Remember in, in emergency care, you'll be told that uh, you're not uh, managing the machine, but it's the patient. So SPO2 can have errors and you may need to be aware of this, that if the probe is not correctly uh, attached or if it gets this, it can give you errors. So, and it's always good to check on the, if it has the monitor that you're using as a perfusion index, it's always good to look at it or look at the uniformity of the waves of your SPO2 monitor. So you need always to make sure that you have a consistent wave before you make the reading. Movement during a conversion or shivering also affect the SPO2 reading becomes unreliable. Low perfusion, you said if the perfusion index is low, then your reading will not be reliable. Cold extremities also, the reading will not be available. Uh, bright light, so for SPO2 monitors, use SPO2 monitors. Okay, so SPO2 monitors use um, light uh, with a source of light on one side and a photo detector on the other side across the blood. Someone please mute Rosalie. Okay, sorry. So we said I was saying explaining that the SPO2 uses a photo light on one side and um, and a photo detector on the other side. So if there is too much light around the machine, then it confuses the machine and you can get a reading that is not reliable. So our machines will be affected by nail varnish or inner dye. So you also need to be careful about that. Carbon monoxide reflects the light the same way as oxygen doesn't bound to the hemoglobin. So you can get a reading of 100%, but it's not oxygen. 
that is getting the reading it um, it's the carbon monoxide so in carbon monoxide poisoning in carbon monoxide poisoning so then you may need to in carbon monoxide you may need to get the history so they are in a smoke room an enclosed area then suspect carbon monoxide poisoning and give the oxygen even with a with a reading of 100 percent so we said children who are unconscious and on oxygen also look out that they're not having carbon dioxide accumulation and uh, that the spo2 doesn't tell us about carbon dioxide accumulation it just tells us about oxygenation so the unconscious children you may also need to and all other severely ill children you may also need to keep checking their, if they are accumulating oxygen so remember you if you suspected pneumonia can think of starting antibiotics early uh, bronchodilators will continue you've seen the use of ipratopium bromide in severe asthma also magnesium sulfate can be used in severe asthma you've seen the use of steroids in severe asthma so in case uh, K oxygenation is not improving there is evidence of co2 retention especially if you've done your blood gases then you may need to escalate care so that can involve mm, moving to a pediatric icu and start a sip up uh, or they may even need mechanical ventilation always be ready to bug if uh, in children you'll bug uh, a lot if uh, especially the smaller ones but they always have good outcomes especially if you can get uh, intensive care either niku or piku then you always been able to you need the skills of ventilating with your back valve mask a lot sometimes they can even get to apneic attacks either after conversions or even for the preterms so you just need to bug for effectively for a short time and they can pick breathing so always be ready with your bvm and have the right techniques remember we can always have your nasogastric tube or orogastric tube to decompress the stomach always uh, can uh, do your head or co2 monitoring uh, if uh, even some bvms can be able to do that so that tells you about your uh, if you're retaining co2 and if, even about your speed of ventilation whether you are hyperventilating or hypoventilating so we've uh, intervened at breathing giving oxygen correctly being able to monitor the oxygen titrating so you can increase the oxygen that you're giving to what you are targeted as PO2 of 90 to 96. So you've been able to do that, give bronchodilators, uh, give ipratropium or magnesium sulfate in severe asthma. So you can always check the specific uh, guidelines for your hospital, but in severe asthma you'll need those you'll need a bronchodilator and steroids quite early so that's standard so uh, we've mentioned about that oxygen bronchodilators monitoring effectively now we can move into assessing circulation as we do our abcd assessment so at circulation we want to start by checking the large pulse so for infants infants are babies less than one year we check the brachial pulse and then for older children we'll check the carotid pulse so we'll check the large pulse for the rate and the peripheral pulse for the volume so large pulse for the rate peripheral pulse for the volume so um, to maintain the blood pressure you will get peripheral vasoconstriction and that uh, reduces 
the, the peripheral pulse and also makes the extremities cold. That's why we are getting, the, we are also checking the temperature gradient. And also the capillary refill time will be more than uh, two seconds. So capillary refill time of three seconds and more is um, it's good to note. So if you are able to get the cuff, the cuffs, the pediatric cuffs, they come in different sizes. We have neonatal, infant and older child cuffs. Then you can be able to check the blood pressure. So the, the systolic blood pressure for different ages, it, it, um, 70 plus 2A, so that is to estimate the temperature, the pressure below which will be hypotensive. So systolic blood pressure 70 plus 2A, where A is H. So for example, a five-year-old child, you expect their systolic blood pressure to be 70 plus 2A, A is five, so it's two times five, 10. 80. So it should be above 8. If less than 80, then there'll be hypotensive. That is a systolic blood pressure. So that's a, a formula which is easy to remember, and you can always check the blood pressure. Remember also, you can also have the other extreme. But in this case, we are worried of a hypotensive patient who could be presenting with shock. Also, blood pressure changes late, especially in 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 hypotension, in shock, or hypovolemic shock, blood pressure changes uh, quite late. So I think that's why we also don't do a lot of blood pressure. By the time you see changes in blood pressure, these need to, to, to act very fast. So blood pressure in children will change late. So they'll compensate for a long time, but remain uncompensated for a short time. So the other thing we'll be able to, to keep assessing or to monitor is the urine output. So you can start early to think of uh, monitoring urine output. In the immediate contact, you may not have the information. Uh, so maybe weighing the diapers may not be uh, so reliable early on. So uh, to think of monitoring and maybe start, um, start your your measures can have your folate in as early so that you can be able to get to monitor you in output. So that tells us about uh, organ perfusion. So other signs we check for is the uh, sunken eyes uh, and a skin pinch. Can check for if there is severe palmopala. Check for severe wasting or edema. So uh, this time you can also attach the monitor. And check the heart rate, can check the rhythm. For newborns, we'll also need to listen for mamas and we'll be able to see the reason for that, uh, that shock in newborns, especially within the first week, could be due to closure of, um, of the of the so in case they had a cardiac lesion which was uh, ductal dependent. So remember to attach the monitor and check the rhythm. So we mentioned about checking the heart pulse for the rate and peripheral pulse for the volume. And you explain the need for that. Feel the temperature gradient and the capillary refill time. So you press the pulp of the finger for five seconds, release and count. For highly newborn life, within the first few days, you can do the pressure over the sternum because their peripheral circulation is still opening up. So you use the, the impress of the stomach for five seconds and be able to release and count and how many seconds it takes to refill. You said more than two seconds, it's abnormal, then you need to uh, note that. So shock, our worry is shock as we do this assessment and the shock can be due to a pump problem, a volume problem in the system, a piping problem. So remember that. So 
we have uh, four main types of uh, shock. So hypovolemic shock, this is due to fluid loss. In children, is usually due to diarrhea and vomiting. It can be due to bleeding in case there was trauma. And then, then can we have cardiogenic shock? Uh, the arrhythmias are less common in children. It can be due to valve dysfunctions, uh, drugs, electrolyte imbalances affecting the pumping of the heart. Uh, obstructive pump pulmonary uh, can be due to uh, pulmonary embolism, tamponade, and even um, tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax it can be common in children, especially those who have had extensive a period of uh, bugging. So distributive shock also can be seen in, in children. This is due to massive vasodilation, can be due to anaphylaxis. The neurogenic is due to um, head injury or spinal injury. And then septic, septic shock can be seen. And you can also get a distributive shock due to anesthesia. And especially the one which are causing, uh, especially if you ever use spinal anesthesia. So to, we said you'll attach monitor, uh, check the problems, is this need to check the rhythms presenting. Bradycardia in children is usually due to oxygenation and drug toxicity. So check them out first, improve oxygenation, uh, before you give uh, infusions. Um, so, you know, not, um, before you give medication, so you can use epinephrine and atropine are used. Remember to check the potassium and any toxins that the child can be exposed to. So, bradycardia in children, number one, check oxygenation, then check medications. Later, when you pull out the problems, then you can use the epinephrine and atropine. So tachycardia common is sinus tachycardia, and uh, that one we need to treat the cause. Could be the hypovolemia, could be uh, pain. So we'll also check the sinus tachycardia. So if it's SVT, it, uh, it has a common arrhythmia in children, we can do vagal stimulation. It doesn't work, we use adenosine. 0.1 milligram per kg, but do not exit the adult doses. Do not exit adult doses. So IV access, you can do IV or IO. I think in children is where you see, I've seen a lot of intraosseous uh, lines being inserted. So, and they are quick. You even use the um, bigger needles, bigger hypodermic needles. If you don't have, um, if if you can get gauge 18 uh, the better if we can use gauge 18 you can uh, comfortably insert an io it's good to also have the actual io needles so it's easy we use the anterior medial surface of the of the tibia going at 90 degrees and kiss so, uh, the upper upper third of the bone but always avoid the uh, growth plate so you'll be below the tibia tuberosity, avoid the growth plate because the bones of the children are still growing. Go in at 90 degrees and you feel the give, you feel that pop that you're in the marrow. So IO works very well. We practice with the chicken bones, feels the same texture. So it, IO, the quick access and gets fluid into circulation very fast. So for IV access, the bigger the better, in case you need to, to give volumes. So secure your line well, then you give your fluids. So the fluid of uh, choice is ringers lactate, and um, ringers and normal saline are the isotonic fluids we have. So ringers lactate, uh, in the, there was that... Um, a big study, the, the first trials on fluids, and uh, Ringer's lactate came on top of uh, normosaline. Normosaline can be used for few boluses, but if you need to keep infusing, then 
fingers lactate is superior. Now, mosaline has higher chloride ion content, and keeping repeating no mosaline, the higher chloride ion worsens the acidosis. So that's why the the rigors, uh, it was um, better than uh, no mosaline. Call for help always. Remember to always call for help as you might escalate care. So the other intervention, you are checking for palma pala. So in our setup, uh, severe anemia can occur and is need to collect samples for blood grouping and cross match. If you even before you get your full hemogram, it, it's good to plan, especially if you know that there was palma pala, and especially if there was also respiratory distress, that becomes a medical emergency and you need to plan to transfuse uh, immediately. So uh, then we need to get, uh, even if you look at the pulse manual, the signs even for the different types of shock, uh, they are more or less the same. And then we say even the capillary refill time, it's either prolonged or variable. So there is no clear cut signs that can distinguish between the types of shock. So what really count is the additional information that you get apart from the patient uh, clinical signs. So this information includes like the history of diarrhea. So if there was massive diarrhea and vomiting, then you'll know that the child has a uh, hypovolemic shock. So if they have not been having diarrhea and vomiting, but they have been febrile for some time, they have been quite sickly, then you can suspect uh, septic shock. So that in additional information is what you need. And then for us, that uh, if there is severe acute malnutrition, the uh, management will be different. And if there is severe anemia, also management will be different. So note that burns, trauma, and anaphylaxis um, need also to be identified because also there is need for additional treatment uh, and their fluid management will be the same as you'll also be able to see even problems like uh, shock with DKA, the treatment will be different. So always get this additional information so as you be able to, to treat shock. And uh, there is evidence now that just blindly giving fluids can, be, can, be, can cause poor outcomes. So as give fluids, you need to, to not just push fluids rapidly, I think as we had been taught previously. So you need to, to be more careful with our fluids. So for the ETA guidelines, there is need to, to get uh, this information and we also uh, classify uh, the children uh, as being severe, having severely impaired circulation and having some impaired circulation. So you'll be able to see if they have all these four signs of shock, then they'll be termed as having severely impaired circulation. So see if you have peripheral pulse, if it's weak, they are cold, their capillary refill time, temperature gradient is, is a line of demarcation. They have cold extremity to a certain extent. Capillary refill time, three seconds and above and more than conscious level is altered, then you say they have severely impaired circulation. So again, remember the monitor is running, we are checking the rhythm, blood pressure, and the heart rate. So diarrhea with the severely impaired circulation, they are fitting the criteria, and this, we said it's hypovolemic shock. This is the only time we give rapid boluses, ringers lactate, over 15 minutes, you can repeat uh, the bolus if need be. So this is the only time you'll give rapid boluses, and this is in line with other international guidelines as we'll be able to see. So that's hypovolemic shock. So we said in anemia is a problem in our setups, especially in some uh, regions. It could be due to malaria and other complications. So severe anemia in respiratory distress 
and severely impaired circulation. So we said if there is severe pallor and any sign of uh, distress, said that term medical emergency, so you need to transfuse as soon as possible. And transfusion is uh, 10 ml per kg packed cells, or if you get whole blood, it's 20 ml per kg. So transfuse urgently and usually we transfuse for three to four. So if there was severely impaired circulation and, and um, severe anemia, do not give bolus fluids, do not push boluses. They were found to be harmful for the children who are pale and they, they need their fluids, do not push fluid boluses. You can give maintenance fluid uh, before you get your blood. Okay, so you can give you or as you try or, or as you refer. So you can give maintenance fluid. Okay. So maintenance fluid, you have uh, the formula for calculating maintenance fluid. For babies less than one kg, we give 100 ml per kg per day. So it's 100 ml per kg per day. So that is the fluid distributed over 24 hours. It's the maintenance fluid you can give. But do not give fluid boluses, child with severe anemia, and signs of shock. Do not give fluid boluses. So if the child presents with severe impaired circulation, there is no diarrhea, there is no anemia, with or without signs of malnutrition, this is mostly likely septic shock. So if they have a history of being febrile, for example, so you're picking off septic shock. So this one, these children, you'll give 20 meals uh, of ringers lactate slowly for two hours. So in severe acute malnutrition, we usually use a fluid with dextrose because you need to treat for glycemia early. So you'll also use uh, the same volume, 20 meals per kg of ringers lactate, 5% dextrose to run also for two hours. The children with shock, and there was no evidence of loss of fluid, and you really suspect septic shock, then this is the volume to use over two hours. Remember, it's over two hours. The hypovolemia, we pushed as fast as you can, but uh, if it's septic shock, you'll give the first bolus over two hours. So, um, so impaired circulation, and slightly not severely impaired, just impaired, then these children did not warrant a bolus or cause extra fluid uh, was causing harm. So they were only getting maintenance fluid. And also we have a system of treating other levels of dehydration and children will go into to those levels, especially if they have diarrhea. So if there's no diarrhea, then they are getting maintenance fluids. I remember if you are to give fluids over uh, 24 hours, we use uh, fluids with 5% extras. So this uh, uh, is the PULSE guidelines, the 2020. It's uh, th that trial, it was in in, in East Africa, can I include it? It, form, it informed a lot of uh, fluid management, especially in children. And uh, we, we saw the impact of that trial by most of these uh, guidelines have, have been changing. Fluids for everyone. We give fluids for, we give fluids for, for septic shock, the volume was reduced with, to give 20 meals to everyone. So in septic shock, the volume was reduced. And um, the cardiogenic shock also you give uh, 5 meals, DKE also 10 meals. So we can say um, hypovolemia, it's uniform. You can see that that trial and the caveat, you know, these guidelines that is in septic shock where there's no evidence of fluid loss. 
you'll be more cautious of your fluids and if you are able to do uh, invasive monitoring of pressures then you are able to even give fluids more objectively but we are not giving quick boluses for all types of shock i think that's the point to take home so we have given fluids in circulation if they were needed we attach the monitors and being able to treat any arrhythmias and we've uh, given blood if there was uh, uh, a, a severe anemia we need to plan to transfuse so that was um, uh, sorting out the circulation problems so a b c d so now we at d disability is to note level of consciousness so we need to determine the need for dextrose so usually do a random blood sugar you can check use the avpu scale so avpu is a straightforward scale that is useful to rapidly uh, grade a patient and uh, and depending on their level of consciousness uh, you can use a glasgow coma scale modified for children for infant children so but avpu is a straightforward where it stands for uh, alert child is alert then you don't need to check anything else if they're not alert then check response for voice if they are responding to voice you don't need to check anything else lower than that if they're not responding to voice you check response to pain so you usually rub the sternum gently as you add more pressure then you are able to check if they are responding to pain if they're responding to pain appropriately then you class them at p if they're not responding to pain then you appropriately then you term them as unresponsive so uh, random blood sugar hypoglycemia is one of the h's in the pediatric uh, h's and t's so hypoglycemia you need to check it so blood glucose less than 2.5 that's uh, 45 milligrams per deciliter so if you have a child with severe acute malnutrition the cutoff is higher three millimoles per liter so for these children then you need to treat for hypoglycemia and we treat uh, with 10% um, dextrose at 5 mils per kg uh, some guidelines will give at 2 mils but uh, locally we use 5 mils per kg so then remember to always every time you give a bolus you must plan to maintain the, the fluid either through feeding or maintenance fluid with dextrose to avoid rebound hypoglycemia remember to always maintain the fluid so we'll uh, uh, continue with exposure we'll come to that okay so remember the a b c d oh yeah so yeah so uh, if there was trauma you'll be worried of uh, health injury if there was um, if if in if there is altered consciousness think of head injury in trauma children are falling from balconies also um watch out for that you have mentioned about the avpu you can also have the chart uh, for gcs we have the modified chart for children we look at the pupils and also uh, check the we have mentioned about the random blood sugar avpu have explained the avpu but for the pain is where you the, pain, the response must be appropriate um, so we have um i don't know if there's a way we can vote and be able to classify these children it, So is this child with the branula the okay, and there's this other child mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you can tell me, is the level of consciousness the same or are they different? So maybe quickly you can write at the chart if it's same or different level of consciousness. So you rub the sternum gently, then add some pressure. Different, different, different. Who thinks they're the same? Yeah, so I think majority are saying they are different, which is correct. There are different okay. levels of consciousness. It, it's okay. I think you can proceed now. I think that this, the, the, the child where the video is playing, they're actually unconscious in our AVPU classification because the response to pain is not appropriate, does not involve localizing. So it's not appropriate, especially for children above nine months. Nine months and below, it's difficult for them to localize even if they are okay. So it's, uh, you don't use um, the pure AVPU scale for children less than nine months. So for neonates is even simpler, they're either okay or not, they're either alert or not, able to breastfeed or not. So that can tell us about their level of consciousness. So this child uh, with a yellow line, they are able to localize and even with the draw. So that is the correct response. AVPU at P, uh, this other child was able to localize AVPU at U. So the causes of breathing problems, uh, so this is what you use in another training, call it grasping. Uh, an easy way to remember, the child is having a consciousness due to a problem inside the head or a problem outside the head. So that's a good way to remember. So if it's inside the head, it could be an infection, infection, injury, bleed, or a tumor causing the altered consciousness. So it could be a brain problem due to an infarct, infection, injury, a bleed, or a tumor. So if it's outside the head, it's either due to something which is low or something which is high. So you look also for the lows could be low oxygen, low BP, low glucose. Okay, so these are common. Other ones which also happen is low sodium, hyponatremia, low temperature, hypothermia, low thyroid can also cause the child to have altered consciousness. So common is oxygen uh, shock and low glucose hypoglycemia recovered well in our H's and T's. So outside could, uh, due to the highs, could be high CO2, high temperature, high levels of drugs, could be alcohol or other poisons or toxins. So uh, after the other assessment we do is checking the pupils, look at the size, are they equal, are they reacting uniformly to light? That also can tell us is it a problem inside the brain or, uh, or something else. So if the pupils are unequal, it could be uh, something inside the head, usually increased intracranial pressure. So it's something inside the, the head. So remember the hypoglycemia, hypo, hypoxia, hypotension are common causes. And we said they need to check the blood sugar. We had sorted out hypoxemia at B, hypotension at C. So we cause the, the they cause altered consciousness. Uh, so look out for new onset confusion. A child who came cooperative, then all of a sudden they started uh, being confused. Uh, so for a new onset confusion, it, it's a warning sign that there's something going wrong somewhere and you need to recheck and reevaluate quickly what's happening. So a confusion that starts immediately 
So let's start uh, with um, the tell new onset. Then you need to, it's a warning sign. So it needs to tell you, you need to review and be able to check what's going on. So we've uh, checked the disability. We did our AI and sorted out airway problems, checked breathing, we needed oxygen or a bronchodilator, checked uh, circulation, we needed fluids, depending on the type of problems, and needed blood. So we checked disability, we are worried of the uh, problems of the brain or something in the system. So in the systems, we are looking for elevated or uh, low levels of either glucose, fluid, uh, oxygen and we've been able to uh, give dextrose if there was hypoglycemia. Now we get to exposure. So exposure, we do a quick uh, head to toe. We are looking for any rash, any bruising, a sign of infection. For neonates, we look for if the cord is infected. So we are looking for making a quick head to toe. And then you also check the core temperature and the febrile or are they cool. So remember to also still maintain dignity of the child as you do your quick exposure. And also maintain that you're not overly exposing and can cause uh, hypo, hypothermia. So quick head to toe, you can pick problems maybe which have not been noted earlier. Look for those rash. Uh, could be sh um, showing signs of infection. Uh, we also look for bruising, uh, quite important, because uh, um, children who are abused will come with uh, uh, scars and bruising of different uh, ed of different times. So you need to be able to check out and being able to match the history with, with the injuries that are present with the babies. So look uh, also at the back, okay, so you'll be able to check. So for the small ones, it's also the time you feel their muscles for the muscle tone, if they are floppy or if they are active. They'd look out for bleeding, look for the bruises. Check the diaper if they, okay, so you'll be able to and check. You can be able to tell how this tool looks like. So, and then check out if they have any plans. So that's our A, B, C, D, A. Then you also need to keep adding more history. Remember our secondary survey, use the sample, uh, get the presenting complaint, history of allergies, past medical history, especially relevant to the current presentation. Uh, okay, so, uh, the last meal and the events leading to the current situation. Okay, medications is M, so remember the medications and if and when the last dosage was taken. Okay, so then make sure that uh, you've prescribed the fluids which were to run for a longer time that they are still running. If they need drugs to continue and continue monitoring oxygen, we set our target. Keep reviewing the H's and T's in case so you keep ordering more tests in order to check out the, as you plan to admit or refer this child. So other pediatric uh, points, remember the children, uh, they don't give their their their, their, their story, so it's somebody else who depends on their story. Uh, somebody was saying the same thing happens in veterinary medicine. The client doesn't talk. So sometimes also our clients don't talk. These other people who talk on their behalf. Is you need to look out. Uh, they cannot communicate on their own. So it's, uh, they also in unfamiliar territory, the hospital, their lights, their noises could be a scary environment for them. So always uh, make it less stressful for the family and the children because it's a whole new experience for, for them, especially the older children can be able to perceive more 
so talk to them. We uh, we talk to all our clients, all our children, even the new units. Uh, so we talk to all of them, even if you think they, they can't hear. So you want to reassure all our clients. So children have a strong survival instinct to work with them. So they they they'll fight, they'll keep fighting, so support them. So remember also we need to uh, manage our own anxieties, our own uncertainties and fears in managing the children. So the more people are uh, anxious, the more mistakes they, they can make, the more errors they can make. So it's a pink pink compost, follow the steps one at a time, go through your A, B, C, D, E. So as you notice, most of the guidelines now, they have a whole uh, uh, chapters on communication and teamwork. So uh, just to emphasize on use of the SBA as a communication tool, SBA is where you may be referring this child or you're transferring them to PIKU or NIKU. Then you need to explain the situation, uh, what's happening now. Maybe you uh, became hypoxic and you started on oxygen. If you have a short background, child who was unwell until a few hours ago, then your assessment of the situation now and the recommendation <coughs> that sorry. The recommendation is <clears throat> what you want the team to do and also what the team can advise you to do as you transfer the patient. So it's, it's a quick tool, it's an easy tool to use and can make our communication and the communication more focused and uniform. So thank you for listening. So I think we can open up to discussion and um, comment. Back to you, Ubi. So I think you're now open to yes, uh, uh, discussion. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Jason, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that uh, awesome presentation. Uh, one of the things I picked from that was that children are not small adults, and I think that's really where sometimes we tend to uh, go a bit wrong in regards to how we deal with uh, pediatric cases in the emergency department. <clears throat> and uh, you find that uh, when these children come into, uh, when they come into the department and you, you're the person who's there with them and trying to figure out what's going, with, what's going on with this child is that you tend to think more in the adult uh, uh, side of um, things, rather than remembering that there are not just physiological, but also anatomical differences between adults and, and pediatric um, patients. And this is one of the things that I've picked up from this presentation, and I thank you so much for that. And uh, now, as I said, we're, we're now opening the floor up to questions for anyone who feels like they have a burning question and uh, something that they need to ask. I know there was a message that I got um, during the presentation from Ahmed Omar, who was asking um, in regards to neurogenic shock, what is the management for neurogenic shock in pediatrics? Uh, uh, just wonder if you can answer that for us in the meantime, as I wait to see uh, anyone else who may be having a question, kindly raise your hand if you do have a question, uh, then we can just follow that order and uh, see uh, whether we can be able to answer any of the questions that you may come up with. Yes, this presentation will be made available uh, it is being recorded, so we will make this available uh, to the EMKF uh, website. So you may you will be able to uh, take it, uh, be able to get it from there. So uh, I'd like to open the floor to anyone who has a question. But first, we can have that answer about neurogenic shock. Um, Jason, if you can. Um, using the PAL guidelines, so you'll give the fluids 10 mils per. Uh, per kilo, uh, but neurogenic shock occurs due to the loss of vascular tone. So there's also need to, the same can also happen in septic shock, the loss of a neuro, neuro tone. So the sympathetic tone is lost due to the disconnection of 
the nervous system to the blood vessels to keep the tone on. So if the fluid may not work, so they need to start um, anotropic uh, support early on, and um, you can use uh, epinephrine infusion, continuous infusion, or dopamine. Advantage of dopamine, you can use a peripheral line as you refer this child to a specialized center. So, but at least you know that you can do, you can do, you can do fluid and also anotropic uh, support. Maybe a comment from anyone who has, uh, who has handled this can share our experiences. Okay, anyone who has um, had an, an opportunity to have, to, okay, has been able to manage a child who has been in shock, um, whether it's neurogenic, uh, hemovolemic shock, uh, anyone who can give us maybe an experience. And what, what I can say is that what I have seen in regards when you're doing um, resuscitation when you compare pediatrics and adult uh, resuscitation is that in most cases, uh, uh, personally, this is my personal experience, is that children tend to be more resilient. Children fight. I think they fight more than adults do. And also on the inverse is that as the healthcare providers, we also tend to fight more for kids than we do for adults. I think there's usually a, a point where for the child, it's more, everyone is really more um, psyched to do something to, for this child to actually just be able to save this child's life. And I'm not saying that we, we do less for adults, but I'm just saying that at some, at some points we see that children tend to be more um, resilient and they tend to survive better. Even, um, I think even in levels, of, when we discuss things like um, hemo, hemovolemic shock and all these other types of shock, uh, in my personal experience, I've seen the children tend to actually, you know, recover much faster. Okay, much faster. And they're more resilient in terms of when you're doing the resuscitation, uh, you have a much higher chance of achieving DROSC with a child if you're actually doing uh, the proper CPR as is, as is meant to be. Um, so anyone with a comment, uh, question, anything? Um, this has been an interesting topic on pediatrics and many people have been asking about um, pediatric emergencies and how we do this and uh, maybe uh, just so maybe if I can ask one question is um, you said that uh, you are a trainer with ETAT and uh, maybe you can let the people in the in the group know how does one have access to training in ETAT how do we uh, when are these uh, courses done where are they done what is the average cost of this um, uh, things um, done in the country so that at least we can begin to build a core we can we can begin to build a group of people who actually have um, Training in emergency triage and um, uh, triage training, and also now looking into how uh, linking people up now into things like uh, pediatric advanced life support or the European pediatric advanced life support and uh, such things. Maybe you can answer that as I look through the. Hey, yes, yes. I think. Um, something? Yeah. It, 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 it started as a um, WHO program. And then in the region, we added admission care for children. That's why it's called ETAT Plus, plus admission care. Uh, most of the trainings that you've done are usually supported by a um, Minister of Health through different partners. So you've had uh, quite a number of partners coming in and uh, sponsoring trainings. Now there are also teams trainings in, in the counties. So we have different partners training in the counties. Uh, uh, but uh, for it's advisable to train as a hospital. So it gets more affordable that way to train as a hospital. And Kenya Pediatric Association is able to, to, to support that. Uh, so if, if there's a partner, the KP is able to work with the partner and you also have had hospitals or group of individuals being able to to fund the training so it's usually straightforward we discuss the budget the budget varies depending on what the hospital can do in terms of the space meals um, printing of material yeah, so the, the, the constant is the admin fees, which include also facilitation fee for the instructors. But this like printing, uh, it's like meals and paying for the venue. 
then those ones vary and usually discuss with the with the hospitals. So it usually ranges from it's usually around ten to fifteen thousand per person. Uh, per it's a it's a one week training Monday to Friday, so five days. So we've had also shortened versions, but these are ideal for for schools. Uh, people who are already in school, but uh, for practicing healthcare workers, we recommend the five-day training because it's the whole of pediatrics in in five days. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I think that's what you can say, and maybe um, yeah. be able to share my contact, and I can advise further on the specifics. But uh, it's just going through the open budget uh, with the with the hospital. If the hospital can cater then the budget significantly reduces, especially if they're able to provide this. Thanks. So, so, thank you so much for that, Jason. I saw uh, Joanne Dirangu, your hand was up. You can unmute and uh, ask your question or give your comment. Okay, all right. So thank you so much, Jason, for that amazing presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask on what I'm seeing on the chat, several people have asked, Maybe you can touch a little bit on TKA management for pediatrics because that, that's something that I always have a challenge with. Because the way you manage an adult, I believe, is very, very different when it comes to pediatrics, especially TKA. I mean, you don't want to pump them with fluids as you do with adults. So maybe you can touch a little bit on that data. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, thank you for the question, Joan. Um, Jason, the question is... Okay. is yes, yes. Complete? And it's also, it's also been asked uh, quite a few times on the chat box, so I think that's an answer. That's something people really want to know about. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay, let me try. It's a lecture on its own. <laughs> let me try to, to answer it. Yeah, so the fluids are diff, uh, different in... In DKA, uh, I saw uh, EMKF had shared a guideline we, which is much simpler than what we use, but similar. And I think uh, we can be able to to uh, share it. So if uh, there is a shock, we said you can use 10 mils per kg uh, as the initial bolus for the resuscitation. So we start, you can be able to note that. So first, if they shock, you give a bolus of 10 mils per kg, and you can repeat. So if you can repeat once, then it comes to 20 mils per, per kg. So you can give bolus. So then we saw that you may need to give that bolus over a longer time. So the first one is... Um, you can use more than you can so that you can give an even up to the one hour. So that is one. So we can use the resuscitation in shock, you lose a uh, bolus. Then after that, you need to plan our not all children will come in shock, but if they're in shock, we that point number one that we start with the uh, bolus. So if they are not in shock, then we need to calculate our fluid requirement for 48 hours, two days, fluid resuscitation for 24 to 48 hours. So remember in DKA, so we, you are, you have changed the concentration of plasma due to the loss of fluid. So if you don't want to replace the fluid so fast, because you'll be diluting, you'll be diluting the plasma faster than the brain. So you'll be changing the osmolality of the plasma faster of the brain. So fluid movement across the brain, the brain is slower because of the blood-brain barrier. So you don't want to give rapid fluids if you're not in shock. So if you give rapid fluids, you will cause cerebral edema because the fluid will be moving from low concentration in plasma to high concentration by osmosis to the brain. So it will cause cerebral edema. So we need to give our fluids 
over two days, 48 hours. So we calculate the fluid requirement for 48 hours. The way we calculate our fluid requirement is we'll give the maintenance fluid uh, plus any deficit. So we'll give maintenance fluid plus any deficit. So maintenance fluid has been simplified to 100 mils per kg over uh, for the first 10 kgs and then 50 mils per kg for the next 10 kgs that is from 10 to 20 and then use 25 some guidelines will 20 20 mils for any other additional kilogram so for example a child who is 24 kgs and they come in then you need to calculate their maintenance fluid so for the first 10 kgs is 100 mils then you add the next 50 mils per kg for the next 10 kgs that will be 50 times 10 that will be 500 then there are 24 kgs so the 4 kg times 25 so it is 150 25 so 100 is the first 10 kilos the next 10 50 the next anything above that is 25 mils so that simplifies maintenance fluid Remember, it's meant that is 100 mils per kg per day. Then 50 mils for additional 10 kgs per day. And then 25 mils per day. So that is maintenance fluid. So those are the new percentages. Previously, there were some other age specific maintenance, but there's agreement that. The, that's the way we usually calculate normally the maintenance fluid first 10 kgs 100 additional 10 50 mils per kg uh, anything above that is 25 mils per kg i've given the example of the 24 kg so it's 100 times 10 50 times 10 4 yeah, 25 times 4 100 times 10 yeah, 50 times 10 then 25 times 4 for a 24 kg baby that is per day so if it's 24 hours it will be time if it's 48 hours it will be whatever you get times two because it's two days then you need to add deficit deficit is usually depending on the level of dehydration so mild dehydration will put it at three uh, percent a moderate dehydration at um, 5% and severe dehydration at 8%. Uh, so there are other guidelines which will put up some higher, higher percentages. So the love mild at 5, uh, moderate at 7, and severe at 10. Okay, so uh, you can agree maybe in your setup the, the percentage to use but uh, the key thing is monitoring and being able to to be able to uh, continue monitoring and being able to know that you are adequately hydrating the child so deficit you are adding to the maintenance fluid so the assessment is based on clinical signs mild in just minimal sign or no signs of dehydration. Moderate if they have dry mucous membrane and reduced skin targa. Severe, they have sunken eyes and prolonged capillary filter. So that is being able to pick the signs. So you can also use the some setup, we can use the pH and the levels of bicarb to be able to classify the severity of the hydration but you can use the clinical signs and be able to give so i was mentioning about um about the maintenance the fluid requirement being maintenance plus deficit so we have said deficit depends on level of dehydration so if it is three 
percent, five percent, or eight percent. So, for example, if a child has mild or severe dehydration, you have said it's eight percent. So it will be eight percent times weight times a constant ten. Ten is a constant in the formula. So it's percent dehydration times weight times ten. So our child had severe dehydration and there were 24 kg, so it will be 8 times 24 times 10. Then we add that to our maintenance fluid. So that will be our fluid requirement for our maintenance fluid was for 48 hours. We got the daily times 2 and we have gotten our deficit, we add it to the maintenance fluid. So we let the fluid run for one hour, then you can now start insulin if you're treating BKA. So insulin, uh, insulin initially start at, um, insulin we, we start at uh, 0 0.1 um, international units per kg as you continue monitoring your sugar. So that means you need to have uh, more than one line or have a central line so that you can run the fluid and run your insulin infusion. So insulin starts one hour after you've started your fluid therapy. Okay, then the other components about DKA, you may you also need to supplement potassium. You supplement potassium if it's below 5.3. Okay, so you'll supplement potassium because you've been losing uh, you've been lacking insulin, insulin maintains potassium intracellularly. So you might have um, normal levels of potassium in plasma, but inside the cells there's reduced uh, insulin and you've been losing this potassium, there's reduced potassium and you're losing the potassium in urine. So we start supplementing potassium if it's below, uh, 5.3 millimoles at the rate of 30 millimoles per liter of the fluid. So you'll add the KCL, the fluid that you're going to make. So if you're hanging the 500 ml, so you'll be putting uh, 15 millimoles in that fluid continue. So you'll be preparing, you'll be setting up fluid uh, if, if you're using the 500 ml the uh, uh, bottle, which you may also need an infusion pump. So you may need to to give 15 millimoles for every bottle of fluid that you're giving, as you also still continue monitoring your potassium. But remember, you have been losing potassium, and the plasma levels may look normal. But uh, since there was lack of insulin to put to move the potassium intracellular then the total potassium levels are low. The other thing that you don't, you don't use bicarbonate to correct the acidosis. Okay, so you continue hydrating until you have sorted the pH. So for example, let's see if we have gotten this formula. We've said our maintenance fluid is 100 ml for the first 10 kgs. 50 mils for the next 10, 25 mils for any other additional kg per day. We are drawing up our fluid for 48 hours. So our, maintain, our fluid requirement is maintenance plus deficit. Deficit is calculated by percentage uh, of dehydration times weight times a constant 10. Then we hydrate for one hour. After one hour is when we start our insulin infusion. We usually start at 0 0.1 international units per kg. Uh, so, so that until our sugar is below, it's below 14, that when you move to subcute. Okay, so let's try out if you can be able to calculate this fluid and write your answer on the chart. 
24 kg baby, what will be our fluid uh, requirement in 48 hours? 24 kg baby, they have severe dehydration. So let's use 8% as the level of dehydration. They have severe dehydration, we are using 8%. So fluid requirement will be any answer, 24 kgs, we can work out together. 24, we say it is uh, 100 ml times 10, that will be 1,000, plus 50 times 10, that is plus 500, plus, 20, to a plus 25 times 4, that is 100. So that will be 1,600 for day one, that is per day, times two, that is 3,200 mils, three liters, 200 ml. That is maintenance fluid without factoring the deficit but for two days. We calculate fluid over for two days. But you know how it is going. So if it's one day, the practice is two days. So this child may have years because of the electrolyte imbalances so they'll be npo so they'll be npo so that's why you're planning fluid for 24 hours so we have gotten our maintenance then we need to add you may need to add you may need to add the deficit we said our deficit is eight percent our, so it is 8 times 24 times 10. We are using the weight of 24 for our scenario. So 24, so 24 times 8. So in pediatrics, you must have a calculator. So if you don't have a calculator, it could be witchcraft you're practicing. So 24 times. 24 times uh, 8 times 10 is equal to 1920. So 1920 mLs plus we had seen 3200 for, so our child will get 5 liters, 120 mils over 2 days. So divide by 48, so that is 100 mils per hour. 106 mils per hour. So remember, for every liter, you are supplementing 30 millimoles of potassium. So this uh, potassium, uh, you will continue monitoring. So for that, a guide. So you will continue monitoring, especially if the levels you said are below 5.3 millimoles per liter. So I think that uh, makes it easier. It's, it's a whole lecture on its own, on DKA, but uh, remember the key things, need to supplement potassium, don't give the fluid so rapidly, and sometimes you can even subtract the resuscitation bolus, okay? Especially if the child uh, was not in shock and you gave some resuscitation fluids. But if they were in shock and you gave the resuscitation bolus, you may not, you may not need to, to, to subtract the, the deficit. Okay, so for the 24 kg child, we'll get 106 or 107 uh, millimole, mil of fluid per liter. You will need an infusion pump. Rapid fluid bolus will cause uh, cerebral edema, and you've seen how that happens. Joanne, I think that's, um, is it clear? <clears throat> okay, Jason, uh, I think that's very, very clear. But uh, just a cl small clarification mm -hmm. uh, between insulin and potassium. I'm thinking you start insulin in children, mm -hmm. and we know uh, most patients from uh, a DKA patient will most likely present with hypokalemia. Uh -huh. <laughs> In, in insulin supplement your potassium. You're really not going to lower your potassium if you can tell us. 
you, you said you're starting insulin one hour after starting the fluids. You will hydrate for one hour, then you start insulin. Yes. Yeah, I think that's another key point. Start your insulin one hour after starting the fluids. So start insulin one hour after hydration. Also immediately, especially if the levels are below 5.3. Okay. So the, right. the potassium goes to the fast fluid at the rate of 30 millimoles per liter. So, but we give our fluid in, remember we give our fluid in a bags of, uh, of 500 ml. So you may need to be giving uh, 15 millimoles for every bag of the uh, fluid. So you give 15 millimoles. Hydrate for one hour before starting insulin. Uh, thank you for that, Jason. I yeah. agree that DKA is a whole um, major topic on its own in both adult and pediatric uh, medicine. And I think that will be one of the topics that we can uh, put a clip on and know that we are going to have a, a proper discussion on diabetic ketoacidosis in both pediatrics and adult management. And uh, from what I'm seeing from the chats, uh, most of them, uh, the chats actually congratulate you, Jason, for the wonderful presentation, which is true. It's a, been a great presentation. And uh, it's been given by someone who has extreme knowledge in this particular field. Um, I'm seeing one question here by Kelvin Wamboy, who's asking, uh, if in hypovolemic shock without severe anemia and malnutrition, if you give the two boluses in 15 minutes, in 15 minutes each, but on reassessing the child, the child is still severely compromised or is in shock. What do you do next? Yeah, so if you're given two boluses and uh, you thought, if it's purely a for volemic shock, there should be some response. But if you're still fluid refractory after two boluses, there may be serious need to recheck. Sometimes you can have child who present with sepsis, a sign of the sepsis is diarrhea and vomiting. So you can have uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, the child who present, maybe they're, just, they're septic, but they also had signs um, or, or evidence which could lead to a diagnosis of hypovolemic shock. So the goal was, the idea was to alert you that it, not be, it may not be just hypovolemic shock. There is need to review and maybe to the protocol for septic shock, especially if there is any other evidence of time. But two boluses, you should have some form of response. It might be some trusted response, but you must have some form of response. So if if it's trusted response, you may even give another third bolus if they are still in shock and you know that the fluids are. Are working so but more than two boluses and there's no response at all then you really may think that fluid is leaking somewhere it could be septic shock okay so it could be septic shock and you need to you need to to relook and possibly uh, if especially if in a place where you can monitor it's okay to give another bolus if you're able to monitor and being able to uh, to to you have already seen that the boluses are working but if the two boluses have no response at all you could be dealing with another type of shock probably septic shock and you may need to use the, the guideline for septic shock uh, still we'll give uh, another fluid for uh, uh, two hours, and then you think of anotropic support thereafter. So you can have epinephrine and dopamine uh, infusions for anotropic support. So it, yeah, so I think uh, there's something you can still do. No response, uh, you may need to change the guide. If there's some trusted response, then you can still give another bolus, especially if you're in a setup where you can continue monitoring. Okay, uh, thank you for that response, Jason. Um, I see we have uh, Nelly Atieno whose hand is raised up. You can unmute and ask your question, but before you do, I have two questions here uh, for Jason. Uh, one of them is, how much of hypertonic saline is used when you're doing nebulization? And the second one is, 
Uh, please comment on the use of adrenaline in the management of LTB, especially on the strength slash preparation of the adrenaline. Yeah, so you can be ruminating on that one as uh, Helen. Um, Helen, please kindly unmute and ask your question or give your comment. Helen? Okay, uh, this one, I think you can just answer the question as you wait for Helen to, oh, Nelly, for Nelly to, Nelly, uh, you can unmute, please, and ask your question. Nelly? Okay, there seems to be a bit of a challenge. Um, Jason, you can just continue with the answers. And... Yeah, so uh, uh, hypertonic saline, we use three meals, mostly we use three meals. Uh, the aim is, we said, is to, the, to break down the mucus and so that the child is able to bring up the mucus and you can sanction it out. Uh, so, and, and also to, to reduce the inflammation. So in, 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 in the, that was in, in bronchiolitis, the use of hypertonic saline. Yeah. So, yeah, so there was a question by my, I recognize the presence of my Mualimu. <laughs> there is uh, use of adrenaline in LTB. LTB is laryngeal bronchitis group. So we use the one in a thousand uh, preparation of adrenaline, one in a thousand. So that is the one commonly available, one in a thousand, and we use two meals of the adrenaline undiluted. The two meals of the undiluted for nebulization in group. So in LTB, so you use the two meals. So our that, that was our local guidelines. Is the ITAT guidelines give two meals of the one in a thousand. Okay. Uh, thank you. This question has been answered. Um, Nelly, I see you have unmuted. Would you um, are you able now to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, Nelly, we can hear you. Continue. Hello? Yes, hello, Nelly, we can uh, hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah, I want to ask you this question. I want to uh, just want to overemphasize the importance of uh, rehydration before administering insulin. Because most of the time it's a challenge, especially for uh, the approach they are given, even the nurses, to find. Uh, Nelly, um, you seem to have muted, uh, so we can't um, hear your comment. Okay. Uh, as we wait for Nelly to uh, maybe unmute and be able to give us her comments, anyone else um, with a question, a comment um, that you'll want to be addressed? Uh, Nelly, I see you're back. Hello, Nelly. Okay, now we seem to be having some network challenges, 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 but these ones are expected. Um, anyone else? Uh, for those who are asking about this presentation, it will be made available at the EMKF website, which I will put um, the, the links in, uh, I'll put the website at, in the chat box. Uh, then you can just be able to fold, to check on our website um, later on this week and you'll be able to find this and other presentations that we've been doing over the last uh, couple of months and uh, many things that we have. And also you can be able to leave suggestions on what topics you want to be discussed, what um, things that are burning issues in regards to emergency medicine and emergency care. You can give us, uh, you, you can drop us an email and just let us know uh, what you would want to be discussed in the next, in the upcoming sessions. Uh, mostly from now January of 2022. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Jason, thank you so much. This has been a very wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank I you. really appreciate And uh, and I know I caught you at short notice <laughs> to create this presentation, mm -hmm. but it has been it's been very wonderful. 
Uh, this is thank you. Quite, <laughs> yeah, this has been quite something. Thank you so much. Uh, to the rest of the participants. Um, okay, I see there's a question here. Um, but we, I think this one was already answered by just one of the time uh, in regards to hydrating for at least one hour before introducing insulin in DKA. Uh, but like I said, we, uh, DKA is a topic on its own. It's, it's a very huge um, aspect of emergency care. We do get a lot of patients coming in DKA, both pediatric and adults. And uh, that's one of the things that I, we will endeavor to have a, free, a full discussion in regards to DKA. And I think that one I'll reach out to Jason again to give us the pediatric perspective and I'll get another speaker to tell us about the adult side so that we can just have one, you know, one uh, good discussion in regards to manage, how to recognize, how to intervene, and how do we take care of both uh, pediatric and adult patients who present with DKA. I, I know it's quite, a, it's quite a topic that needs to be discussed and also to look at it from the point of if you're in a, a space where you're in a resource poor uh, setting and whether you're in a, an urban area, how do you go about dealing with patients with DKA? Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Uh, so, Jason, um, any uh, parting words to our participants who have joined? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been quite a team that has been here. Uh, Jason, any any last words? Uh, wait. Hey, hey, um, so, uh, so, I think it's to encourage us to uh, help us uh, take good care of our children. I think one person, I'm not sure if it's Nelson Mandela who said that you can judge a society by the way it treats its children. So yeah, so the care we give to our children reflect on us as a society. So I encourage us to be advocates uh, for the children. We have seen that they don't uh, uh, talk on their behalf. So we are the voices of the children. So in being their advocates, and we can improve their care. They improve very fast, and it's just upon us to be able to put in, in place systems that prioritize children. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the EMKF team, for this opportunity. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you so much, Jason, for that. Uh, I can see Lavinda Akini has her hand up. Maybe she can give us a comment, and then we can be able to close this session for this month, and then we can... Uh, Look forward to the next one with on the 20th, yeah, around the oh, 24th, actually, 24th, the last Saturday of this month. We'll be having our next EMKF open mic session. Um, Lavenda, can unmute. Yes, thank you so much for giving uh, me and other participants uh, this opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, forum. It was a nice discussion and uh, he has really touched so many topics which are really vital to us as clinicians and any other healthcare practitioner. Now, uh, I happened, my question, my concern or a request is, I happened just to get crashed into this program because I was in a certain group and uh, it was advertised there. And I know I'll be there, I'll be told to leave the group any sooner. No, my question is, is there a way we can get communications through our emails, which we registered with, with a lot of ease? Okay, yeah, I, I, get your, I get your question. Yes, it is true that we, we tend to advertise uh, most of these uh, talks through groups and uh, usually send out the link for people to register for the Zoom meeting. But the, the one place where you can actually be able to get all this information is um, at the EMKF website, which I'm going to put it up right now in the, in the chat box. So you can have a look at it and then you can just be checking there and also on our social media pages, we usually have we really uh, advertise these um, talks uh, like in advance. We usually prefer to advertise them around two weeks prior to the talk. But this week we actually had just only a week to advertise um, due to some certain challenges. But yes, uh, <clears throat> you can check on our website. We usually have all these things there and it's very easy to get it from there. But now sending it, I'll, I'll talk to the technical team and see whether it's, it's easier for us to send this to people in regard to the emails that they use to register. So they can also tell their colleagues who are not members and things like that. But in the meantime, we can just be using the, the EMKF website and uh, yeah, our social media handles, which we can able to get from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yes, those are and also on our website. So those, those are the places where we, we are at. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you.
Okay, you're welcome so much. Um, okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us this Saturday morning for this uh, discussion in regards to pediatric emergencies and uh, from our wonderful presenter, uh, Mr. Jason Kiruja, the, on behalf of EMKF, uh, my name is Dr. Mutu Ambuvi. Uh, thank you all for joining us and I wish you a lovely, lovely uh, weekend ahead. And uh, let's take care of our children, like I just want to say. Yeah, let's take care of our children. Thank you so much. And we'll have this recording available in our website. Um, have a good day. Good night.